Hi, welcome to our channel Good New. The era of China as the world's factory is ended. Is this true? During the 2020 US presidential election, there was an intriguing trending search on Twitter, hashtag Trump made in China. Trump is preoccupied with the election, and his campaign is massive. His fans applauded heartily as well, wearing caps, flags, outfits, banners, and slogans. However, we discovered that the label made in China was widely observed in the crowd. It was discovered that all of these supporting components originated in China's Iwu market. This is not one of Trump's gimmicks, rather, it is the self-consciousness of a businessman. He is fully aware that if these peripheral items are indeed manufactured in the United States, the efficiency and pricing will be inferior to Iwu, China. Let the world know that the world's factory is still in China, and that this individual is a significant contribution. Back in November 2001, the World Trade Organization opted to admit China as a full member. Since then, global commerce has shifted to favor China. China has progressively risen to prominence as a key commercial partner in Asia, Africa, Europe, and South America. China's manufacturing has transformed the country into the world's factory, but in order to do so, China had to through a hard period of economic experimentation. How did China manage it? How did China go from a backward agrarian community to an industrial behemoth? Please subscribe to our channel and enable the notification bell before we begin today's video. Let's have a look at the topic we'll be discussing today. China's fast ascent is not an exception, but rather a return to historical norms. Prior to 1800, the GDP of the Qing Empire accounted for over one-third of the world's GDP. Domestically, China has a market economy that is as advanced as Europe's, and vast amounts of silk fabrics and ceramics are shipped to Europe, resulting in an imbalanced trade surplus. However, China's massive population can only reach to this stage, and the emergence of the Industrial Revolution in the West hastened the European Empire's colonial endeavors, which was a tragedy for China. Beginning with the Opium War in 1839, a succession of foreign invasions hindered China's economic progress. First, British steamers pushed Chinese ports to open to the opium trade, then the Russians conquered portions of Manchuria, and by 1895, Japan had taken over both the Liaodong Peninsula and Taiwan. Simultaneously, a succession of violent rebellions and civil conflicts erupted. China's early pioneers recognized the importance of industrialization for survival, but the nation was too huge to modify its backward self-sufficiency, and the Qing dynasty's modernization strategy failed, even after replacing the imperial-ruled Republic of China administration. The unstable situation lasted until 1945, when the Japanese army was evacuated from China, and by 1949, when the People's Republic of China was created, countrywide reforms could finally be implemented. Initially, there was considerable success, and industrial output was increased, particularly in the manufacture of steel, coal, and petrochemicals. However, although heavy industry has thrived, agricultural productivity has lagged, putting great strain on China's food security in the context of post-war baby boomers and workforce urbanization. Meanwhile, in Japan and South Korea, Large-scale manufacturing was emerging during the 1960s and 1970s. How did Japan and South Korea fast recover after the war? They normally follow a three-step procedure. The first was land reform, which involved dividing huge estates into smaller pieces to allow market competition, which in turn improved food production, enhanced agricultural efficiency, and sparked a significant movement of farmers to cities in search of work. During this time, urbanization was taking development in the surrounding area. The second stage was to restructure the economy to focus on export-oriented manufacturing. East Asian nations began to dominate global manufacturing, particularly in consumer electronics, by utilizing their new urban workforce and existing export infrastructure. By focusing on exports, Japan and South Korea can generate the foreign exchange required to accelerate technology transfer. Third, each government has implemented tight financial laws to funnel money to sectors preferred by its development strategy, 
with low interest rates permitting cash flow back into national infrastructure and commercial investment. Furthermore, capital regulations hinder the rich from shifting money abroad. At the same time, the lower exchange rate increases the competitiveness of East Asian exporters. Naturally, Western firms have fought these rules, and Asian companies have unfettered access to the U.S. market while U.S. companies are barred from entering Asia, leaving many business owners angry because much intellectual property has been stolen. However, the U.S. had no problem with this trade-off at the time since it needed strong friends in Asia which explains why Washington deviated from its free trade ideals by letting its allies to operate a business-list economy. China, on the other hand, is very adept at learning from each other's capabilities and beginning to restructure its economic system, and has taken a similar three-step method. China's hidden weapon is the country's large land and people. With the opening of China to the outside world, China began to value the manufacture and export of light industries such as apparel, cosmetics, and toys, and Made in China became an autonomous brand. At the same time, the establishment of new factories encouraged urbanization, with China's urban population increasing from 190 million in 1980 to 300 million a decade later, and over time, some restrictions on private enterprise were relaxed, prompting some state-owned enterprises to become more competitive, and China has gradually become the world's factory since the late 1870s but China's biggest test is the acquisition of technology. The US unconditionally enables Japan and South Korea to supply technology, but China must offer some returns for American firms. China has devised a strategy that permits export-oriented firms to establish plants in coastal special economic zones before upgrading regional export infrastructure like port roads and railroads. Western firms find this mix of first-world infrastructure and third-world labor prices appealing. As a consequence, foreign direct investment climbed from zero in 1979 to 40 billion in 1997 and 290 billion in 2013. Being the world's factory offers several advantages, including the ability to access the necessary technical capital. China's size and natural advantages have come to dominate global commerce by narrowing the technological gap. Between 1978 and 2019, real GDP increased from $150 billion to $14.3 trillion in current dollar terms. In 2001, over two-thirds of the world's countries traded more with the United States than with China. By 2018, those figures had flipped. That is a massive rise. China's admission to the World Trade Organization in 2001 enhanced its leading role in the global commerce ecosystem, and being the world's factory implies that China will soon dominate international trade. China has become not simply the world's factory, but also its most important trade partner. However, in order to advance, China must continue to cultivate its local market. The next objective for China is to have a mature and developed economy. Made in China 2025, the Belt and Road Initiative, and efforts to construct China's Silicon Valley are all about making it happen. Do you have faith in China's economic growth? What economic reform initiatives do you believe China can implement over the next decade? Thanks for having your watching in this video. You can add your ideas or suggestions below. Please keep following our channel and like our videos.